Hi, Vetfolio Voice listeners. Happy you're here. This episode is sponsored by DECRA and features Dr. Laura Gaylord. In this episode, Dr. Gaylord and I focus on supplements, and she helps break down how to choose a reliable, safe, and effective supplement for your patient. Personally, I love the use of supplements in practice. I enjoy working through kind of these chronic medicine cases, so often patients where we're in it for the long haul and who often end up needing long-term care. Over time, not uncommon for them to develop comorbidities, which in turn limits the dosages, durations, the types of drugs that we're able to use for them. In my practice, I feel like I've seen significantly improved quality of life in my patients when I've incorporated supplements into their treatment plan. And because of this, I've been able to limit the dosages and durations of different drugs they're on, overall helping to limit side effects. I'm Western trained, so heavily rely on the use of FDA approved medications in the treatment of my patients, but certainly appreciate the incorporation of nutraceuticals to help supplement these treatment plans whenever possible. Dr. Laura Gaylord is a board certified veterinary nutritionist and one of only 100 diplomates of the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine subspecialty nutrition. She's an independent consultant and the owner and founder of Whole Pet Provisions, PLLC, a nutrition consulting company established in 2016, which offers veterinary nutrition consulting to pet owners, the pet food industry, and pet supplement companies. She's been a general practitioner in North Carolina for over 24 years, working in integrative and physical rehabilitation practices. She offers homemade diet recipe formulation and commercial diet consultations through her business for pet parents and the veterinary team. Combining her years of clinical experience with passion for nutrition, Dr. Gaylord seeks to promote optimal wellness and integrative veterinary care for companion animals and the pet vested industry. Well, I am joined again for this episode by Dr. Laura Gaylord, who is a board-certified veterinary nutritionist, and we're going to talk about supplements. And Dr. Gaylord, I love using supplements in practice, so I'm really excited that we're having this conversation because, you know, of course, you always want to do something that's effective for your patient and and safe at the same time. So I'm glad we're going to dive into that a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I actually really am interested in supplements as well. I mean, I'm a nutritionist and my, my focus has always been the diet itself, but all through practice, I've been in practice for over 24 years myself. I've always been interested in supplements and looking for ways, you know, how can I use them? How can I use them safely and appropriately? So I'm really thrilled as well that we're having this talk today. Yes. Thank you so much for joining me. Great. Great. So how are we going to dive into this? Well, you know, let's start at the very beginning. You know, we're talking about both of us love to use supplements in practice, but let's add some clarity to what we're talking about here. What exactly defines a nutritional supplement? Yeah, very good question. And in fact, that's often a point of confusion for a lot of people that come to me with with diet questions. Um, I, we look at supplements in two different ways. We look at the diet itself needing vitamin mineral supplementation, but those are really there to meet the nutritional requirements for that pet. So your complete and balanced pet food is going to have a list of vitamins and minerals. Um, when we formulate a homemade diet, it's also going to have a vitamin mineral all in one type premix added to it. But that's not really what we're talking about with supplements. With supplements, we're looking really beyond nutritional requirements. We're looking at how we can use things. And th- these may be foods, other vitamins and minerals or herbals or botanicals, other things we're using, trying to maintain a healthy pet, maybe influence a disease condition, even uh, maintain wellness is what we like to say with supplements. Um, So we're really talking about what we call therapeutic supplements, not nutritional supplements. And these are also have the term called nutraceuticals that we like to use. Okay. Okay. I'm glad that you made that distinction because I don't really make that distinction in my head between a nutritional supplement and a therapeutic or nutraceutical type of supplement. And thinking about the the types of choices that I make when I'm reaching for supplements for my patients, this, this kind of seems like an obvious question, but 
why is it so important to really have that careful consideration and to be so careful when we're choosing our supplements? Yeah, it's, it is careful because uh, pet supplements really don't have uh, strict regulation out there. You know, human supplements have some more defined rules, but there really isn't a lot of oversight of pet supplements right now. There, there is one organization we call the National Animal Supplement Council that is making some effort to have, you know, some standards for pet supplement production, and they're doing an excellent job with that. But really, it's a little bit of the Wild West. So you really want to be careful, make sure you have a product, you know, that you've thoroughly investigated, that you look for some quality standards. You know, the National Animal Supplement Council is looking at labeling. They're looking at compliance with that. They will do some random product testing. They have some quality control uh, and production procedure standards they want to see. And they look at the ingredients and they're really setting up. This is really the only body we have right now that is setting up standards overlooking pet supplements. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Like, what are some of the potential downsides if we're not careful in choosing our supplements? And aside from the National Animal Supplement Council, who it sounds like is a great source of information as far as making sure that we're choosing quality supplements, what other things can we do to make sure that we're choosing a safe and effective supplement for our patients? Well, when you look at the product itself, so you definitely want to look at the label and make sure that it's got, you know, a a lot number, the manufacturer's information is listed there, what it contains, what, what species it's intended for. So sometimes it may say only dogs, it may say dogs and cats. Um, you know, so it should indicate what its its intent is for. It should li- list the actives that are in there. So what are the ingredients and how much is in there that it's intended to be, you know, what is it intending to provide for that pet? It may have inactives as well. All of that should be clearly listed on the label and easy to read. Um, so that would be very, very much the first requirement. You want to be familiar with the company. Uh, So definitely we we look for that National Animal Supplement Council um, provides a seal that can be right on the label as well. So that's really nice to see that it's there. There are some supplements that have been made by companies that have been around for a very long time that have relationships with veterinarians that may not be NASC company sealed products. And I still use those as well. I have some and I know they're invested in the veterinary community. So really it's a history of use then. So if you're comfortable there, Um, Beyond that, I would be looking for companies that have um, research behind their products. Either they're providing research for the actives that are in those products, or they actually have done a study on that supplement itself, and that's available to you in some way. So maybe on the website, you can find information there. Look at those studies, though. Read them. See what they're all about. How many dogs were in them? (laughs) How big a study it was? Was it actually in a dog, or was it another animal species? You know, sometimes you'll see Uh, lab animal studies or human studies. And while that's all information, you know, it's not as great as if it is actually in a dog. Absolutely. Uh, We know those don't always translate. So making sure that we read those studies and then so thankful to have our board certified specialists out there to help us with those studies and interpreting them. Absolutely. Yes. Um, Not always an easy job, even for me, but I I try my best. Oh, my goodness. The more I talk to, um, you know, some of my friends that have PhDs and specialists and things like that, trying to talk about these studies, the the more I'm just like, oh, gosh, like, you know, how how do I make it through some of these? Yeah, I mean, it can be really confusing. I think even as part of my nutritionist training through residency, we we get schooled on that a little bit, you know, look, look at where who did the study, maybe what school it comes out of. Always look for who sponsored or paid for the study because that's always information. Um, Looking at the power, the number of animals in the study, what kind of study it is, and then going through, you know, the results and the power of the study, the significance of their results. So sometimes just because it's a study does not mean it's a good study. So that's really good, you know, to have that awareness at the same time. Absolutely. So let me make sure I heard all of that correctly from you that when we're looking at a supplement and we're evaluating it, in addition to looking for this research and, you know, is there any data on the actives or the product itself, especially in the target species, looking for 
the the lot number, the expiration date, the species that it's intended for, making sure that that company kind of hits that minimum information. NASC uh, seal is great, and hopefully they have that as well. But then there's also something to be said for clinical experience and clinical use and, and comfort level there and, and the company that you're working with. Absolutely. I, I guess the only thing I would add to that too, when you're considering a supplement is if you look at their marketing, sometimes marketing goes way beyond what it should as far as providing information about supplements. And it's actually not okay to try to say this, this is going to fix a disease state. So supplements, the intent with using them is to support health. And there's actually rules about that. Once they start saying they're treating disease conditions, then they're actually crossing into the zone where they should be a drug and that should be regulated by the FDA. So there is some line there they're not supposed to cross. If you go to the website and it looks like it cures everything. So <laughs> <laughs> that's always a red flag to me. Like it, you know, cures every disease state known to dogs and cats. And yeah, I'm a skeptic. I'm going to really think about that. Um, I, I feel like all supplements allude to disease states in some way. That's fair. But I think, you know, they, there's ways of doing that that is respecting that it is a supplement. It's not a drug and it should stay in that in that zone. So, yeah, just just have that awareness when you're looking at marking materials and what's on websites. If it sounds too good to be true, it is too good to be true. <laughs> Absolutely. And more is not better. I like to say, too, when you're looking at a label, um, sometimes there are supplements that have, you know, a thousand ingredients in them. And, you know, it depends on what kind of product it is, but sometimes that raises my concern. There could be interactions. So more is not always better. Sometimes simple is better and we can influence or change dosing a lot easier if it's a product that has less stuff in it. Um, but that's in conflict maybe with herbal medicine concepts where they're looking for synergy with their ingredients. So having okay. some understanding of what the product is and kind of what zone it, it, its intent is for is also a good idea. Absolutely. So much to consider. And you mentioned that products aren't supposed to treat a disease state, which explains that label on the back of supplements. It says not evaluated, not evaluated by the FDA and not intended to um, right. what does it say, treat any disease, state, something like that. Right. So that kind of segues perfectly into my next question, which is, you know, the red flags that we need to be aware of. Like, you know, you talked about the marketing being too good to be true, uh, it going too far and suggesting that maybe it can do more than it can. Any other red flags we should be aware of that would chase us away from this supplement? Yeah, I think I think the ones we've mentioned are the the main ones. You know, if if there's lacking of information on the label, you know, then that makes me worry that there's, you know, there's no tracking of that product. There's no adverse event reporting. Um, if there's too much, you know, in a claim for a product, then it's going, it's just trying to, uh, it's trying to capture everybody and make you buy that supplement. So that's not necessary. And that is definitely a red flag. I think if, if there is no history of quality or use within veterinary medicine at all, you know, it's okay to be a little suspicious and hold back and let things go out there and have, you know, some track record before you start using them too. So look, the, that would be a red flag to me if it's a brand new product, something I've never heard before, company I've never heard of before. Right now, there is just huge uh, predictions for revenues in pet supplements. It's one of the talking points in a lot of uh, the pet industry um you know, magazines and literature that's out there. So that means what we're going to see is an explosion of products. So this is why, you know, having that list in mind when you're trying to choose something is a good idea. Yeah, that makes sense. I feel like those revenues in, that are projected in the pet health industry, which are just crazy. And I don't even know if it's like the pet health industry. I think that's part of it. And the, just the pet industry in general uh, is very big, which I think in some ways is going to be really beneficial to our patients. And we're going to see a lot of good stuff happen. But like you said, equally as important to be a little little discerning, a little wary of some of the new thing. Absolutely. I totally agree with that. So we talked about the FDA not being involved in regulating these products. Are there regulating bodies? I know you mentioned the NASC, um, but who who is regulating these products? Who is doing these quality checks? Um, well, the company itself is actually the one that would be in charge of m monitoring their own supplements, which is really why it's an issue. <laughs> because right, yeah. there actually is no regulating body checking or testing pet supplements. In fact, we joke um, other nutritionists about it. 
will say that these are actually illegal drugs in some way. That's that's I mean, yeah, that that's sense. not really true. But we say that because, um, you know, some supplements are a can be very effective and helpful for our patients. So um, they do have the potential to improve their quality of life. But right, that right now, there is no regulating body that overlooks them. NASC is the first one that has made the attempt to have, you know, some standards. Um, there, If it's a treat product or it falls into the nutrition zone in any way, then it will fall under the Association of American Feed Control Officials. So you might see like some treats with ingredients added that look like supplements. And if they market that or sell it as a treat, then then AFCO steps in and they do have some say uh, in what's going on there. But since NASC might do random product testing, you know, then that's a really good thing because they're checking to see, you know, what's in that and does it hold up to what you're claiming it holds up. And that's going to happen, I believe, more and more for pet supplements. There will be more of that. Uh, so that is a good thing that will raise the standard for all of them. Yeah, especially like we talked about with the potential for huge growth in that uh, part of the industry. Probably, I could see veterinarians looking more and more for that type of seal to say, how do I navigate through these products? Absolutely, definitely. So I think you alluded to this earlier, but just to circle back around to it, If we're looking at a product and it meets a lot of those minimum requirements that we talked about, we're not seeing these major red flags that we hit on, but it doesn't have that NASC seal. Is that a product that we should avoid or, you know, what's your feeling on that? I don't think so necessarily. I mean, I think that there are some companies that have been working with veterinarians for a very long time that have a relationship with them that have provided research you know, over the years. So it isn't 100% a disqualifier for me. I know there's some companies I work with that don't have the NASC seal, and I still will use them because I'm very comfortable with them. Um, And I think a lot of other nutritionists and practitioners feel the same way. So if you've used a product and you have clinical experience with it, it's always worked well for you, you have a good relationship with that company, then that's information for you, you know, to continue using it without any issues. But I, I know some of these companies and I encourage them to be part of NASC. I think that's probably going to be more and more. All of them are moving that way. So we will see, you know, more and more companies become members over time. I am always a little bit concerned when I'm choosing a supplement for a patient. I mean, there's some that I have really solid clinical experience with. I feel very comfortable. But if it's one that's a little newer or that I'm not quite as familiar with, I get a little concerned where I'm like, could this make anything worse? Because I'm I'm not a nutritionist. I'm not an herbalist. And I am not always 100% familiar with the actives or the inactives. Uh, Is that something we need to be worried about? Like what kind of medical consideration should we think of for our patients? That's a really broad question, like to cover all supplements. But just like in general, are there things where you're like, well, really watch out for this type of stuff? Yeah, I mean, I think those are all very, very good questions. And I think even the fact that you're thinking about that is is wonderful because that's exactly the zone we should be in. We should we should be cautious. Uh, I would try to learn as much as you can about what's in that supplement. So that means when you select a product, you know, learn about that active, actually take some time and research it and see what's out there. There is information about most of those actives in these supplements out there. Some of them we're going to be super familiar and comfortable with like fish oil, omega-3 fatty acids or glucosamine chondroitin, a lot of the joint supplements. Um, But there's always like a little sprinkling of new stuff in those you'll notice. Like now we're seeing turmeric and boswellia and other things added in. So, you know, I know we don't have a lot of free time nowadays, but I would tell you, you know, the sales guy comes and gives you the pitch, but do your own research and look into that. There is a lot of information on VIN even about supplements. Um, There are some really good herbal textbooks out there that have been published. Um, Good references there. You know, if you're really interested in supplements, I encourage you to think about even getting one of those and putting them in your library in your hospital so you can look stuff up. Uh, But learn about that because I think it's important that we do know what we're recommending, prescribing, even though these aren't drugs. Um, But yeah, so learn about that. And I I think, you know, going back to less is, you know, more is not better. Less can be more. 
Um, maybe you're not loading them up with a thousand things, you know, cause I, I, when I make a supplement plan for a pet, I might have two, three, or even four things I'm thinking about, but I will add them very, very slowly. Like I'll mm-hmm. start with one and give them one to two weeks and make sure that they're tolerating that and nothing bad happens. And cause I think they're all individuals, you know, and even though we have supplements out there and they're being used, we may not know all the potential side effects for them too, just because they don't have the breadth of research like a drug would have. So just be, being cautious is a good place to be with supplements too. So that's how I do it. I would build from one thing at a time, try to learn as much as you can. Uh, I think that's where you have those long ingredient lists. It's going to be impossible for you to know all the potential interactions for that scenario. So there, you know, being cautious is the safe way to go. Absolutely. And now, um, you know, you've got my ears kind of perked up here because I do love supplements. And uh, whenever I I get to talking about supplements and herbals and stuff like that, I get really curious because I don't have a lot of knowledge there. Are there textbooks that you really like for learning about this? Yes, um, there is a veterinary herbal medicine, um, Dr. Susan Wynn, another veterinary nutritionist, and Barbara Forger um, ha- has published that one I look at quite a lot. I am not a, a herbalist myself, but I, I call myself a baby herbalist because I've taken some courses. So I have a you know a general exposure to it and I really like it, but I, I don't create herbal uh, remedies right now, but I might select supplements that have herbs in them and I want to understand, you know, why they're there. So that, that one I do use quite often. You know, I would say there is not one comprehensive supplement textbook though. Like I think we're still kind of like grabbing here and there. And when I look up supplement ingredients, often I'm doing a PubMed search and pulling research papers in that way and seeing what can I find is um, actually been used in a dog or cat. And sometimes there's some information and a lot of times there's none. And then I'm looking for what else is out there. Like, is there human or laboratory animal studies and how, you know, what disease state were they looking at or what were the effects of that? So it is often putting together a collection of things and then trying to make a decision. But um, we like to see direct studies in our species of interest is if it's at a level where we're actually choosing a supplement that we're going to recommend to our clients, you know, that's where I would like to see a study actually in a dog or a cat using it at least for safety at minimum. Um, but efficacy is another really, you know, important thing, obviously. So get out there and do your research and, and do a good job before just recommending right. herbal. Ho- hopefully and hopefully the company that is making that product has done all that work for you and they can provide that to you when you're considering using a supplement. That That's what you want to see. So you don't have to spend all that time trying to decide. Like I said, I always love these talks because I think I think the herbals, I think the supplements are really interesting as giving us some alternatives when we reach the limitation of pharmaceuticals. You know, I certainly practice Western medicine and I'm so thankful for all of the options we have as far as pharmaceuticals go. But, uh, you know, sometimes they're not without limitations and we do run into contraindications and things like that. So having that additional option and that knowledge, I just think is really powerful. And I'm so glad you came on to talk to us about making sure that when we're choosing these, we're doing a good job. Absolutely. I, I, and I completely agree with you. I think of myself as a Western trained nutritionist as well, but I'm open-minded and I know that with many of our chronic disease states, it's a quality of life issue. And I have seen numerous cases where we can minimize drug therapies, you know, that multimodal approach, trying to look at the whole pet and figure out, you know, how can we maximize, you know, their quality of life. And that's really the goal do no harm at the same time, um, but really, you know, keeping them comfortable and happy and as as well. <laughs> We're supporting wellness. Remember, that's the goal um, with the supplements that we might add to any pet's treatment plan. Absolutely. Well, Dr. Gaylord, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. I always have so much fun. Are there any final thoughts you want to share with everyone? Gosh, I, I would tell you as a summary of this talk, I mean, do your due diligence. Think about supplements Um, Just be careful, you know, select products you're comfortable with that have a good track record that have some oversight and some hopefully an NASC product from companies you trust. 
and monitor them, you know, look into those products, learn about those ingredients. Uh, They can be a really great addition to any pet's treatment plan. Good advice. Good advice. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here today. I loved uh, getting on here and talking with you. It's uh, this has been a great discussion. I'm so glad. I can't wait to do it again. Dr. Gaylord, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I always appreciate having you on and your insight into supplements and nutritional care and just some of the other options we have to really benefit our patients. I also want to say a huge thank you to DECRA for making this episode possible and thanks to all of you for joining us. For more episodes like this, click on the education tab on the Vetfolio website. As always, we'd love to hear your input on this talk, as well as ideas for topics you'd like to hear from us in the future. Feel free to reach out to me at dvm at vetfolio.com. You can also visit my Facebook page at Dr. Cassie DVM, and you can find me on LinkedIn. And remember, if one animal is better off because of you today, it's a great day.